can you think of the transportation incident and the speckled band that would qualify for this episode? Well, he transported a blacksmith over a parapet. (laughs) (laughs) That was levitation. All right. Well, I will leave you in rapt attention until we get to that part of the show then. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's my gift to you. Suspense. Well, that's wonderful. Speckled band. This episode of Trifles is made possible by listeners like you who support us on Patreon and Substack. To learn more, go to patreon.com slash trifles or trifles.substack.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, there were men that were dancing, creeping, and crooked, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? What's a tantalus? Or a gasogene? And what's the difference between a handsome cab and a four-wheeler? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 402, Fateful Voyages. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we get into the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, it's fate that would bring us together today. It is fate. You know, I kept turning over my tarot cards this morning and I uh, found a strange looking one that had dog-eared edges and was mostly sort of twisted gold. And I said to myself, oh, I found my American Express card. Look at that. Don't leave home. I didn't. I'm still here. Yeah. Oh. You know, I once uh, played poker with a deck of tarot cards and <laughs> three people died at the table. <laughs> Not good. It was no longer a full house. No. Um, <laughs> Well, we are here to talk about Fateful Voyages. This episode drops on September the 11th, 2024, Uh. which uh, now marks uh, 23 years since that fateful day in New York and in Washington, D.C. at the Pentagon and in that lonely field in Pennsylvania. We all know about the tragedy that ensued. The reason we're choosing Fateful Voyages is because... What happened on that September 11th, 23 years ago, involved transportation. And we thought, well, why don't we look at the canon and see where we can find instances of some form of conveyance transportation that is associated with something unfortunate, untoward, or tragic happening. Not a happy topic, but (laughs) this is our travel series, and it happens to fall on September 11th, so it seemed... Well, it seemed like fate that we had to do this episode. So uh, we will just remind you that you can find the show notes on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com or on whatever podcast app you happen to be listening to us. We're available everywhere, including YouTube and on the smart speaker of your choice. Just say, play the latest episode of Sherlock Holmes Trifles. And it should come up. Of course, we encourage you to subscribe to us on Patreon or Substack. Our supporters there get additional bonus content, as well as you automatically have your name entered for a complimentary drawing for a back issue of the Baker Street Journal at the end of every month. So it's completely random. All of our supporters are included. So please add yourself to the roster there on Substack at trifles.substack.com or on Patreon at patreon.com slash trifles well we are venturing into the area of fateful voyages um i i I was almost going to say fantastic voyages that was that was a uh 
Fantastic Voyage was a movie from the 60s, wasn't it? Oh, maybe 60s or 70s. Um, they, yeah, they that was. Drunk people down. Was that, was that Fantastic Voyage? Yes, yes, as I remember. Yeah, it was a, at the time, it was a terrific picture. Yeah, special effects galore. Uh, and they, they sent them through a, a human body, I think, to search for something, if I recall correctly. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, we are going to come across human bodies in this episode uh, by the multiples. Um, so where would you like to begin with this discussion, Bert? Well, the interesting thing is within the – it's a, it's this topic is one of these topics that when you suggest it and you look at the corpus of the Sherlock Holmes cases, the, the entire canon – it's another lens on looking at that body of work, at those at those stories, at that writing, at that saga, because transportation features so broadly throughout it. And that's one of the reasons, obviously, why we have a transportation series. But in the same way, you could routinely put your finger down the list of Sherlock Holmes cases and find a transportation that has a dramatic impact on the characters at one point or another, pretty much anywhere. But I think one, one reasonably good place to start would be with the Priory School, which features, of course, as our listeners know, the strange disappearance of Lord Saltar. And one of the things we find out when we're in that case is that one of the instructors at the school where he is currently learning, uh, is out apparently on his bicycle and dies. And that's Heidegger, the German master. And there is uh, probably uh, an early, exp well, an easy identification of a case where a tragedy, somebody on his bike um, meets with a meets with an unexpected and foul end. Yeah, that was uh, unfortunate. And... Um... It looked as uh, Holmes and Watson were looking at the, the tire tracks. Of course, Heidegger's tires were Palmer's, leaving longitudinal stripes, as Holmes uh, told us. Uh, and, and they eventually found uh, Heidegger uh, with his skull smashed in, but he was quite a distance from where the scuffle first took place, meaning that he was still trying vainly to pursue the kidnappers who had taken Lord Salter and um, w was pursuing them uh, until he could no longer remain upright. So, mm. a true uh, a true hero, but uh, tragedy struck uh, as he was on his bicycle. Mm. Well, um, there's another one involving wheels, but wagon wheels. And in this case, we find ourselves. This is this has to be one of the most dramatic and jarring places you can find yourself in the midst of a Sherlock Holmes story, and that is in part two of a study in Scarlet, where you're on the Great Alkali Plain, and Conan Doyle does a wonderful job of describing the geography and giving you a sense of just how barren everything was. Um, everything stood out against the, uh, they said here and there where there were scattered white objects which glisten in the sun and stand out against the dull deposit of alkali. Uh, approach them. They are bones, some large and coarse, others smaller and more delicate. Former have belonged to oxen and the latter to men. For 1,500 miles, one may trace this ghastly caravan route by these scattered remains of those who had fallen by the wayside. Mm. And, of course, we meet uh, Lucy and John Ferrier. Um, she wasn't his daughter at that point. Um, she was um, uh, orphaned in this process, and, and it was just she and he who remained. Um, she, he, she said, where's mother? And he said, mother's gone. I, I guess you'll see her before long. And, uh, and lo and behold, they did their best to kind of soldier through and, uh, finally made it. But everyone else on that wagon train, uh, had, uh, perished. Hmm. 
Yeah, sounds like a good opportunity eventually for a case of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> it's a natural, yeah. It's a natural. Well, and there's another one that just occurred to me. You know, we were talking about this topic briefly before we began recording, but it just occurred to me that yet another one where there's a journey that ends in tragedy, at least mm. in one way, is the solitary cyclist. Because we have the scene at the end where Violet Smith has suddenly disappeared. And Holmes and Watson find the dog cart, and they're um, obstructed by a fellow who uh, comes up on, on the bicycle and draws a pistol on them. And Holmes says, where is Miss Violet Smith? And the fellow says, well, that's what I'm asking you. You're in her dog cart. You ought to know where she is. Mm. We met the dog cart on the road, Holmes says. There was no one in it. We drove back to help the young lady. So there's Violet Smith, you know, who's abducted from her dog cart and dragged off to a uh, completely unofficial marriage. That's a great point. And it wasn't to Heidegger at that point. <laughs> they would have made a lovely couple, but uh, it was not to be. Heidegger, not Heidegger. <laughs> no, I know it's not Heidegger. I'm, I'm crossing streams here between oh, the two you're crossing stories. Streams. Or two oh, bicyclists God. that we Two we bicyclists. Made. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah, now there's another thing. Bicycles in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I wonder if they Yeah, well, we're going to have to get Richard Olkin on for that. Times. Yes, um, yeah, good idea. Yes. Um, well, um, continuing along the pathway here, in The Sign of Four, there is that wonderful climax of a river chase. And... Uh, uh, we we see Holmes and Watson in the skiff in in the uh, steamboat with uh, with uh, Athelney Jones, right? And they were pursuing Jonathan Small and Mordecai Smith, and of course we find Tonga. Tonga whips out his blow blowpipe, uh, and tries to hit uh, the other ship, at least its inhabitants, with a poison dart, and uh, Watson and Holmes fire on him and. Over the side goes little Tonga, lost to the depths of the Thames off of the steamship Aurora. Mm. So, being thrown over the side of the ship there and uh, dead due to a bullet. That's a tragic end. A fateful voyage. Yeah, it is a fateful voyage. And there are plenty of these fateful voyages in the cases of Sherlock Holmes. Another one is a little suspect, but it's worth mentioning, and it's in The Illustrious Client. Mm. Because in The Illustrious Client, we hear of two things. Well, first of all, Baron Gruner is plotting to take uh, his, uh, hope, from his standpoint, his hopefully soon-to-be wife off on a honeymoon voyage, which you know might or might not be <laughs> short for her. But he's also rumored to have murmured his to his to have murdered his wife on the Splugen Pass, and I don't know about your Splugen Pass, but my Splugen Pass is in the Lepontine Alps, and it separates the Western Eastern Alps, and its highest point is seven thousand feet above, and it's known for dramatic scenery and hairpin bends and tunnels, mm. and I'm sure that uh, Baron Gruner was moving, was in transport with his poor, unfortunate wife at that time. So that's something we can impute, maybe, for yeah. uh, trans a journey that ends in tragedy. Yes. Well, and that's why it was uh, entirely likely that he might take Violet de Merville on that honeymoon cruise and toss her overboard as uh, unceremoniously as Tonga. Yeah. But, and I don't know about you, but, um, you know, when anyone... Uh, puts a plate of splugen in front of me. I say, <laughs> splugen, pass. <laughs> Excuse me, would you mind passing the splugen? <laughs> <laughs> ah, the famous uh, splugen pass. It was, it, was a, it was a dance craze of the 1890s. I don't know if you uh, have heard of it. It's like the, <laughs> like the Harlem Shuffle, but... Uh, oh, yeah, I remember that. It was great. Uh, well, let's keep on this nautical theme, shall we? And uh, head over to Black Peter... Mm. Now, of course, the only conveyance we see in Black Peter is the harpoon that was conveyed from the wall through Black Peter to fix him on another wall. However, recall that John Hopley Nelligan was uh, under suspicion of 
uh, murdering Black Peter. And it was very clear, at least to Holmes, that Nelligan would not have had the upper body strength to pin Black Peter, Peter Carey, against the wall with a harpoon. Um, but we do find that when young Nelligan was 10, his father uh, had gotten into some financial difficulties. He stole securities and fled. He started on his little yacht for Norway just before the warrant was issued for his arrest. And uh, he left a list of the securities he was taking and swore that he would come back with his honor cleared. Uh, well, he tells us no word was ever heard from him again, and the yacht and he vanished utterly. Mm-hmm. And um, he said uh, that uh, it was uh, th- th- there. Were, there was some rough weather, and uh, you know the autumn of that year was a stormy one, long succession of southerly gales, and his father's yacht may well have, have been blown to the north, and there met by Captain Peter Carey's ship. And um, Peter Carey was found to be in possession of those very securities that Nelligan Sr. had noted. So mm. uh, it's likely that, uh, you know, Carey uh, encountered him, dumped him in the sea, or, you know, did something untoward, and uh, Nelligan Sr. is no longer with us. Sad, sad news. And there are several cases in the canon, in the world of Sherlock Holmes, where fateful voyages happen by way of administering justice at mm. far remove. Yes. And one, one easy one, I suppose, just to start with, is the Greek interpreter. Because the Greek interpreter has this scene at the end when, of course, the evildoers have gotten away but we learn that Sophie Cratides, who has is, who is survived, has apparently been at sea, and suddenly the... Uh, no, she was pe- on a train. Oh, was she at a train? Yeah, not, not at sea, on a train. Oh, well, you finish the story then. <laughs> clearly, my memory is... Uh, so what, Mon- what is the report then at the Months, end? Months, well, they, uh, you know, they, they showed up at uh, the Myrtles. They found Paul Cretides dead. Right. Uh, the others had escaped. They couldn't trace them. Months afterwards, Watson said a curious uh, newspaper cutting reached us from Budapest. It told of how two Englishmen had been traveling with a woman and had met a a tragic end. It seems that they'd been stabbed, and the Hungarian police were of the opinion that they quarreled and inflicted mortal injuries upon each other. Oh, Um, What do you know? There's no mention of any conveyance here. I I was duped. I remembered the the Granada ending, which happened on a train. (laughs) Oh. oh, well, you see, I was duped, too, because my memory was that that happened at sea. But clearly there's uh, no. There's just no report of exactly where it happens, except it's in Budapest. Right. Never have I ever met a Rudapest. <laughs> well, there is one tale that we know uh, is nautical related and ends in tragedy. Mm. Um, the Five Orange Pips. Right. Remember, this is uh, where uh, 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 who who is the the victim there? Um, Alia, or Elias, Openshaw, John Openshaw, Openshaw, and John Openshaw. Right? They right. they had the the KKK was after them and sent a warning uh, via an envelope with five orange seeds in it, five orange pips. Um, and Holmes is tracing them. He says, I've spent the whole day over at Lloyd's Registers and the files of uh, old papers following the career of every vessel which touched at Pondicherry in January and February of 83. There were 36 ships, blah, blah, blah. The Lone Star instantly attracted my attention. Uh, he said, uh, it's the name of one of the states of the Union. Watson says, Texas, I think. So I was not an am sure uh, am not sure which, but I knew the ship must have an American origin. So he searched the records, determined it was Lone Star, and he said, "I have my hand upon them." Uh, he and his two mates 
are the only native-born Americans on the ship. The others are Finns and Germans. I had it from the Steve door who was loading their cargo. By the time their ship reaches Savannah and the mailboat arrives, it'll have this letter, and the cable will have informed the police of Savannah these three gentlemen are badly wanted upon a charge of murder. But there's a flaw in the best laid plans of men. The murderers of John Openshaw never received those orange pips, which would have showed them that another as cunning and resolute as themselves, was on their track. After long and very severe uh, were the uh, equinoctial gales that year. We waited long for the news of the Lone Star of Savannah, but none ever reached us. We did hear at last that somewhere far out in the Atlantic, a shattered stern post of a boat was seen swinging in the trough of a wave with the letters L.S. carved upon it. <laughs> And that is all which we shall ever know of the fate of the Lone Star. <laughs> well, the fate of Cadogan West is much more well-known. And that, of course, takes us to the Bruce Partington plans, where poor old Cadogan West is on the train and winds up on the wrong side of it, on top of it. <laughs> and... Uh, unfortunately, meets his his sad end. He was subway surfing? <laughs> the, the poor guy. <laughs> poor guy. But well, that's one of the really, really, one of the many really great cases of Sherlock Holmes, that whole series of deductions and discoveries and explorations about that. That's great. Indeed. And then there's one that you told me about earlier that I don't can't identify. Well, before we get to that, let's do the big one. Oh, the big one, okay. The big nautical disaster, and that is, uh, there's a whole story named after it, the Gloria Scott. Oh, I remember that. Yes, this was a uh, transport ship headed to Australia, taking uh, a load of uh, prisoners down there. Uh, you know, they were sentenced to transportation. That that was actually, that could have happened to you if, uh, if you were on the wrong side of the law in a certain time in England. Uh, you'd be sentenced to transportation, which meant that you would be shipped off to Australia and be part of a, a penal colony down there. You could work off your, um, uh, kind of like a, uh, an indentured servant, you could work off your sentence down there. Um, but in this case, there was a mutiny on board the ship, and... We know that Trevor Sr. and Hudson had escaped the, uh, the ship, which later blew up, taking most of the mutineers, including big Jack Prendergast, with them. Mm. So uh, they made their way back to England and started their lives in secret, and uh, the rest of the mutineers went down or, or up <laughs> with the ship <laughs> in mm, that case. Kaboom. So... But yes, let's let's do this th this very um, oblique reference in which story and what is it? Well, I bet the story is the Speckled Band. Uh, you're right. <laughs> How you, did had, I you, know? were, you were struggling with that, as I recall. Holmes, you amaze me. Yes. yes. What, what tragic transportation related uh, uh, incident do we have? Well, it's when Julia Stoner remembers the scooter that she had when she was six, and the <laughs> the day that she she um, scraped her knees, and her sister Helen applied the mercurochrome that that soothed her. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And Doctor Roylott was so upset he threw the scooter over the bridge, <laughs> over the parapet. That's right. Uh, no, 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 you're, you're, you're uh, not even close. Oh no. This is reminiscent of the canonical couplet over on, I hear of Sherlock everywhere. I like that. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when Julia is telling, um, excuse me, when Helen is telling Holmes about her background, mm. she said, uh, when they were in India, Dr. Roylott married our mother. She was a young widow. Uh, my sister and I were twins. We were two years old at the time of remarriage. She had a considerable sum of money, not less than a thousand a year, which she bequeathed to the Roylott, uh, to Doctor Roylott. 
entirely while we resided with him, with a provision that a certain annual sum should be allowed to each of us in the event of our marriage. Shortly after our return to England, my mother died. Mm. She was killed eight years ago in a railway accident oh, near Crewe. Right. Oh, right. Now, there's no indication that there was foul play in that railway accident, but given Dr. Roylott's uh, sensibilities, I wouldn't put it past him. He might yeah. be able to engineer some kind of accident. Yeah, interesting. Oh, I'd forgotten that. That's great. Yeah. So sad. Well, in the world of Sherlock Holmes, in the world of Victorian England, transportation was really a risky business, going out at sea, even riding on the railroads, as you can testify, with uh, Cadogan West and others. Uh, anything could happen. Indeed. And you can be sure there wasn't a snack cart on those trains with trifles. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. But involved with a secret political society. Red anarchists? Oh, you've been talking to Morse Hudson, haven't you? Do go on, Lestrade.